Hello and welcome back to the Island Card Deck USA channel where we discuss the doctrine of spiritism as codified in his writings by Alan Kardec and how God's plan of reincarnation plays a role in our lives. My name is CISO. Today we will continue with the third topic of the reincarnation series of videos I am doing, scientific proof and evidence of reincarnation. A woman named Hanan was born in Lebanon in the 1930s. She married a man named Farouk Mansour from a wealthy family. They had two daughters, Layla and Galare. Hanan later developed a heart problem, and her doctors advised her not to have any more children. But in 1962, she had a son. In 1963, shortly after the death of her brother Nabi, Hanan's health started to decline. When she was 36 years old, Hanan traveled to Richmond, Virginia for heart surgery. While there, she tried several times to call her daughter Layla before the operation, but couldn't get through. Hanan died of complications the day after her surgery. In the country of Lebanon, a girl named Suzanne Ganem was born 10 days after Hanan had died. When the girl was just a little over one year old, she picked up the phone and kept saying, Hello, Layla? Hello, Layla? Remember now that Layla was the name of Hanan's daughter, the woman who died in a Virginia hospital, and had been trying to call Layla on the phone. Suzanne's family had no idea who Layla was and asked Suzanne, Who is Layla? Suzanne, one year old said, Layla is my daughter. Furthermore, Suzanne said, and my name is not Suzanne, my name is Hanan. Suzanne's family may have attributed the matter to the toddler's playful imagination. However, when Suzanne was two years old, she continued speaking about Hanan and a daughter named Layla and continued to name 13 other members of Hanan's family, including her three grown children. Now, Suzanne's family was intrigued. They had spread the word around town about what was happening with little Suzanne, and word eventually reached the family of Hanan Mansour. The Mansour family went to visit the Ganem family, and soon after arriving, Suzanne was able to point at members of the Mansour family and identify them all by name, people she'd never seen before in her life. Also, Frank Mansour said that he showed Suzanne pictures of family and friends and she was able to name all of them. This is just one of many cases that was investigated by Dr. Ian Stevenson who was the director of the Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Dr. Stevenson died in 2007. A Washington, D.C. reporter from the Washington Post named Tom Schroeder had looked into the matter of reincarnation and became convinced that it's real after his own investigations. He wrote in one report after traveling to such places as Lebanon and India, my worldview was upended by the accumulated testimony of very young children who insisted over and over, I am not Bashir or Suzanne or Daniel. You are not my parents. This is not my home. Schroeder later wrote, I personally concluded that this stuff was beyond coincidence. James Leininger was born in San Francisco in 1998. The family later moved to Lafayette, Louisiana. As a young boy, he had memories of a past life as a fighter pilot during World War II and had died in combat. When he was two years old, James would awaken often while yelling from nightmares. His mother had sometimes heard him yelling, airplane crash, plane on fire. When his parents asked about his dreams, nightmares. 
James would say he was killed in the airplane. When his father asked about the plane crash, James said it was shot down by the Japanese. He said the Japanese airplane that shot him down had a big red sun on it. Remember now, James is about two years old. Of course, James' parents were amazed at this little boy's knowledge of Japanese World War II aircraft. They began asking him to provide more details and James said he had a friend who was also a pilot. His name was Jack Larson. James' parents, whom were of deep Christian beliefs and held no belief of reincarnation, eventually decided to go ahead and contact a woman named Carol Bowman, a well-known past-life therapist and researcher of reincarnation. Ms. Bowman advised the parents on how best to deal with the matter. Over time, James became more comfortable with speaking about it, and the details he gave were astounding. He said that his name in a previous life was also James, so that was somewhat of a coincidence. He said he flew a plane during World War II called a Corsair and that it took off from a ship called the Natoma. That ship was actually called the Natoma Bay. He'd also said that he died during the Battle of Iwo Jima. James' father, Bruce, learned that the Natoma Bay crew still held reunions and he attended one of these gatherings in San Diego on September 11, 2002, exactly one year after the World Trade Center terrorist attacks. At the reunion, Bruce learned that 18 fighter pilots from the Natoma Bay had died during war in the Pacific, but only one had died at Iwo Jima, and his name was James Houston. Houston died on March 3, 1945. Bruce later gathered information on James Houston and learned of other pilots that flew from the Natoma Bay ship, including one named Jack Larson, also a close friend of James Houston. Larson was living in Arkansas, and Bruce went to visit him. Larson confirmed that James Houston's plane caught fire and went down at Iwo Jima. He also validated many of little James's memories of the events of that day. A man named Rashid Kadej was an auto mechanic in Lebanon. Rashid was born in 1943. In the year 1968, he was picked up by his friend, Ibrahim. On their road trip, Ibrahim lost control of the vehicle. Rashid was thrown from the car and died from head trauma. About a year later, a boy named Daniel Jurdi was born. According to Daniel's parents, some of the first words little Daniel spoke was the name Ibrahim the friend who was the surviving driver of the car accident that caused Rashid's death. Daniel had also said that his father was a man named Naim. Naim was Rashid's father. Daniel told his family that he was once a car mechanic in the town of Farmada. When Daniel and his mother were driving through Beirut one day, they went past an area called Military Beach. Daniel shut his eyes and began crying. He then yelled out, This is where I died. This place at Military Beach in Beirut was where Rashid Kadej had died. Daniel's father, wanting to put the matter to rest, eventually asked a friend to go to the town of Farmada to inquire about a Kadej family. They were located and they went to visit little Daniel. When Dr. Ian Stevenson interviewed the two families in 1979, both families said that when they first met Daniel, he had immediately recognized Rashid's sister, Najla, and called her by name. The Kadesh family are without doubt that Daniel Jury is the resurrection of Rashid Kadesh. It should also be noted that Daniel, his entire life, 
has had a phobia of being in a car going too fast. On January 18th of the year 1902, a girl named Lugdi was born. She married 10 years later, at the age of 10, to a man named Ketternath Shalby, a shopkeeper who owned several clothing shops. We're talking about the year 1912 now, here in a country where their customs had considered such marriages normal back then. I know that in our day and age, we would consider such a marriage as appalling. Lugdi was very religious, and she traveled to various sacred religious sites at a very young age. When Lugdi became pregnant for the first time, her child was stillborn following a cesarean section. When she became pregnant again, her husband took her to a hospital in Agra, where she had a son on September 25, 1925. Lugdi was now 23 years old, but nine days later, on October 4th, she died from complications after having given birth. Almost two years later, on December 11, 1926, a girl named Shanti Devi was born in India. Strangely, the girl rarely ever spoke a word until about age four. And when she finally did begin talking, she spoke about her husband and children. She's four years old. Shanti said that her husband owned a clothing shop and they had a son. The parents had considered it as having some kind of child fantasy and ignored it but continued with her stories and many details of a past life with a husband. She spoke about the foods she ate and clothing she wore. She described her husband as having a big wart on his left cheek and that his clothing shop was directly across the road from the Wardakish temple. When Shanti was six years old, she told her parents how she had died soon after giving birth. The parents finally began thinking that Shanti was, in fact, describing details of someone's past life. Shanti had often asked to be taken to the city of Mathura to find her husband. In India, it was customary for a woman to never say her husband's name in public. However, a high school teacher in Delhi told Shanti that if she told him her husband's name, he would take her to Mathura to look for him. She then whispered the name into his ear. Pandit Kedarnath Shalbi. The teacher then wrote a letter to Kedarnath Shalbi, letting him know what the young girl was saying. Kedarnath confirmed most of Shanti's statements and said that he would have a relative of his living in Delhi, a man named Kanjimal, visit her. When Kanjimal arrived to meet with Shanti, she immediately recognized him as her husband's cousin. She described what her house looked like in Mathura. Kanjimal was amazed and asked his cousin, Kedarnath, to come visit Delhi. Kedarnath went to Delhi with his son, Navneet, Lal and his present wife. They then tried to trick Shanti by telling her that this man is not Kedarnath, that he is Kedarnath's brother. Shanti said, he is not my husband's brother. He is my husband. Kedarnath had a wart on his left cheek. Whether you choose to believe or not any of these cases I can tell you that there are thousands more, literally thousands. There are excellent YouTube videos that profiles more of these cases. I'll leave a link below in the description uh, for one of them. And if you check that channel's listings, you'll find a lot more. One must ask, how can there be so many people involved in these cases if it's not real? How can so many cases exist? Are people making up these things for some special reason? To make money? To become famous? For the sheer entertainment of deceiving the public just for the heck of it? 
Dr. Brian Weiss is a psychiatrist who specializes in past life regression. I've spoken of Dr. Weiss in previous videos. He treats patients with various traumas by hypnotizing them back through time to their previous lives and having the patient discuss details of those past lives and in that way help solve some of the traumas that they are currently experiencing. He wrote about one of many patients he had treated in a book called Many Lives, Many Masters. In the book, the patient is named Catherine. And while under hypnosis, Catherine discussed events from past lives in vivid details that Dr. Weiss was later able to research and confirm. Going back to Dr. Ian Stevenson, he also discovered during his investigation various individuals throughout the world that while under hypnosis during a past life regression session were able to speak a foreign language that the individual had never known or learned during his or her lifetime. There are many such cases. Here I'll give you just one. During the 1970s in Mount Oreb, Ohio, a woman named Dolores J. had been experiencing severe back pain and her husband, who had practiced hypnosis since the 1950s, hypnotized his wife in an attempt to relieve the pain. While under hypnosis, the husband asked Dolores, does your back hurt? And she replied in German, nein, which means no obviously causing the husband to experience a bit of confusion. During another session, Dolores J. had said, Ich bin Gretchen, which means I am Gretchen. Naturally, this was all very intriguing, and the matter was looked into further. Recognizing the German language, a native German speaker was invited to the home to participate in one of the, those sessions, and he had a conversation in German with Dolores J. under hypnosis, calling herself Gretchen. Dolores had never learned the German language during her lifetime. She had never been around Germans speaking their language, and she could not understand or speak German in her normal state of consciousness. This matter was considered to be strong evidence of reincarnation, and word of the situation was received by Dr. Ian Stevenson, and he traveled to Mount Oreb, Ohio, to meet with the J. family. Dr. Ian Stevenson was able to speak German, and while Dolores J. was under hypnosis, they had a conversation. She'd said that her full name was Gretchen Gottlieb, that her father's name was Hernan and her mother Erica, who died when Gretchen was just eight years old, and that they lived in Eberswald, Germany. And Dolores said that Gretchen had died when she was just 16 years old of an illness. From the details that Dolores, or Gretchen, provided to Dr. Ian Stevenson, it appeared she had lived sometime between 1875 and the year 1900. Dr. Stevenson tried to confirm Gretchen's stories. First, he had her take a lie detector test in which she was asked if she'd ever studied or learned the German language. She said no, and she passed the lie detector test further confirming the matter by locating family members in the town that Dolores, or Gretchen really, said she had lived was not feasible since most of them would have been dead by now. The practice of speaking a language unknown to the person is called xenoglossy. Dolores J. is just one of hundreds, hundreds of recorded incidents of xenoglossy. If you think very logically, about the scientific proof of reincarnation, what can you say about how some humans are seemingly born with amazing talents that were gifted naturally? Talents that were not learned and that can never be learned by most of us. You have a child that can play a musical instrument perfectly and beautifully at a very early age, all on his or her own. Or he can paint portraits with precise details. One may argue that those traits has more to do with the evolution of genes and DNA passed down through many generations into a child 
from his ancestors whom had those traits in their genetic structure. Maybe. Why exactly did I title this as scientific proof and evidence of reincarnation? Because that's exactly what was provided. Science is the study of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment to either prove or disprove a theory, making the theory either false or a fact. Unless you choose to believe that many thousands of reported cases of children speaking of past lives is just fantasy, and hundreds of reported cases of xenoglossy is just fantasy, then the final conclusion of reincarnation has in fact been proven. This will complete the third topic I am doing here on reincarnation. Be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you are alerted when the next topic, why and how reincarnation scriptures were removed from the Bible, is uploaded. If you would like to write to me personally, you can email me at cardecusa at gmail.com. My name is CISO. Have a blessed day.